Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got an amazing Nashville session player and just masterful wizard. We're with Andy Reese and his dog in the background. Uh, <laughs> Andy's been an active member. He's a, Andy's a first call session player in Nashville. He's been an active member of the Nashville community for more than 35 years. He actually left San Francisco, which is where he grew up, to pursue his passion for music as a career in 1980. He was brought up in a household listening to mainly traditional classical music, and he actually even has an ancestor who was a German composer and guitarist in the 1700s. Andy began his formal music education with piano at age seven. He moved to guitar at age 10. And being lucky enough to have grown up in San Francisco during the 60s, he'd be forever influenced by the thriving music scene out there. Some of the many concerts that he actually got to see were B.B. King, Jimi Hendrix, and of course, psychedelic acts such as the Grateful Dead, the Jefferson Airplanes. He also discovered jazz and his guitar work became heavily influenced by greats such as Charlie Christian, Joe Pass, and Kenny Burrell. After arriving in Nashville, he was fortunate enough to have two influential A-team advocates, legendary producer and steel guitarist Pete Drake and visionary Harold Bradley, Harold, who along with his brother Owen, built the first recording studio on Nashville's Music Row and also served as a longtime president of the local musicians' union. Andy's first recording session was for the actor Slim Pickens. I used to love that guy, man. A session. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just like he was always like this iconic. It was like the same role every movie, but it was so cool how he, you know, how he played it. Um, so he did a first session for Slim Pickens, uh, which was a pretty big initiation involving many A-team pickers such as Drake, Charlie McCoy, Bob Moore, Pete Wade, Pig Robbins, and the Jordanaires. Now, Pig Robbins was blind, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah. And, and he's still around, still playing great. Oh, man. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Because um, there was a story. I interviewed Reggie Young, and there was a, a – do you know that story? Ask one of those guys about it, the 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 time Pig Robbins drove his car or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Andy's since become a studio mainstay, playing on hundreds of records with artists including Miranda Lambert, John Oates, Amy Grant, Willie Nelson, Kenny Rogers, and Leon Russell. And returning to his early jazz influences, he's also recorded with many jazz greats, including Pete Chrislieb, B.G. Adair, Benny Golson, and as a member of Bad Rhythm, an exciting trio with Danny Coots and pianist Brian Holland. He's also toured extensively with both that same Slim Whitman and Reba McIntyre. And he's one of the longest standing members of the Time Jumpers, which is an amazing Western swing super group. And they're on Rounder Records. And, and uh, the Time Jumpers members are all A-list Nashville session and touring guys, including Vince Gill. They've enjoyed a 20-year, let me say that again, a 20-year Monday night residency at various nightclubs in Nashville. Nominated for six Grammys, winning one in 2017 for Root Song of the Year. And they've also toured internationally, playing venues as diverse as Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa and Carnegie Hall. And he's also given back to the community with a leadership role in the Nashville Mus Musicians Association and as an educator with the Nashville Jazz Workshop and other venues. And uh, Andy doesn't know this, but like... 20 guys have told me you got to talk to Andy Reese. He is such a badass <laughs> guitar player. I'm not getting you, man. So I think I probably sent you an email with two or three names, but like 20 people have said you got to get Andy on your show, man. So thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your time. My pleasure, sir. Um, so you grew up right in the middle of the counterculture revolution, basically, both I did. Uh, time wise, period wise, and location wise in San Francisco. And I was curious if you were looking back, what were some of the big takeaways or things you learned both good and bad from this experience it's really hard to hard to quantify it it was such an amazing time and i was so young and impressionable you know that my my parents were uh, were both european i'm a first generation american where are, you, where are your folks from uh my mom is from chile and my dad is from poland originally very cool uh, but they're both very much citizens of the world. And they're very intellectual, and um, they had a lot of beatnik friends. So really, even before the hippie movement, I was used to seeing all these beatniks around, you know. 
and um, they would have cocktail parties. And my brother and I would just buy all of them. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> but um, so when the hippie thing came, it seemed almost like a natural evolution in a way. And since I was in the middle of that, it, uh, it all kind of made sense to me. But in retrospect, there was a lot of, a lot of stupidity and bad stuff going on, too. What like? Oh, well, the drug use, you know, the uh, the promiscuity. Were all those know, things well, that rampant, like out there? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I went to a Grateful Dead show one time, and they had people with squirt bottles squirting LSD into people's mouths. <laughs> You're kidding, man! That's pretty wild. And how yeah. how old were you? I was like fourteen, fifteen. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. I, didn't, I didn't take a squirt, but uh, yeah, but probably was, a lot of fifteen-year-olds did. Oh yeah, wow, that's pretty wild. Where'd you? Was this at the Fillmore West? That was at Winterland. So you got to go to all those cool. I mean, oh, the yeah. quintessential arenas. Yeah, my my first concert was when I was fourteen. I went uh, uh, to the Fillmore Auditorium and saw them, but uh-huh. the big hit Gloria. Yep, featured Van Morrison. That's so cool. What were some of like the, uh, if you could even think, or if this, if you could even make a list like this, what were the top few shows, you know, three or four shows that you saw from that era? Well, I was really a big blues nut. So, uh, seeing BB, seeing Junior Wells with Buddy Guy, and my real favorite was Albert King. Yeah, what a presence, man. Yeah, and he still is. His his pocket, his his power, and his grace still really speaks to me. I'm a huge fan. Amazing that he didn't even use a pick, you know, the power of his yeah. notes, you know, just phenomenal, you know. Where did, was most of those shows at Winterland or Fillmore or, or both? Different combinations, Avalon Ballroom. And uh, I remember seeing Albert in some place in Marin County where I was like five feet from him. <laughs> wow. He's a big guy, wasn't he? He was a big guy. That's so he cool. Had- Huge acoustic amps. It was so loud. <laughs> and he made those horrible things sound great. That's so cool, man. Was, was now you gravitated to country? Was there a thriving country scene in San Fran? There was, but I didn't really know about it. It wasn't really in the city itself, but uh, in, in my home, we listened to jazz somewhat and a lot of classical music. But my brother and I would listen to the radio all the time. And we found these country stations, and we had just no way to comprehend what it really was. But it was fascinating. We listened to it. At first, we thought it was ridiculous. And then pretty soon, we were really loving it. Loving the musicianship, the story, songs, you know, everything about it. Is your brother a musician? Um, Sort of, yeah. He's a lawyer, an architect. And a part-time musician. That's cool. Is he out in San Fran still, or is he in Nashville with you? He's in Santa Monica. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's really weird how both of you gravitated towards that. Well, he was a big influence on me, and uh, my mother played piano. My grandmother played piano, and she taught me how to tune the guitar. And, you know, with my ancestor, a guitarist and composer, uh, my very... uh, proper family sort of embraced it. They, they thought it was cool that I was playing the guitar. And you must have, if you're, was that your mom's mother who taught you how to? Yeah. So yes. you probably learned a lot of really cool South American influences from there as well, no? no he was a very classical musician too. And the, they were South American, but they were, they were of English and German descent. Gotcha. And my grandmother grew up in England. So what prompted you to move to Nashville? Well, at some point, if you want to be a professional musician, you have three choices, or at least we did back then. It was New York, L.A., or Nashville. And I married a Southern girl, and I had people who knew a couple of folks in Nashville. It just seemed like a logical choice. Right. And what was your intention when you moved down there? Like, was it to get into sessions or just, like, go with the flow or? It goes the flow, but, but sessions was did definitely allure and allure. I've always rather than 
you know, rock stars and being the guy up front. I've always admired the working musicians, the guys in the back making it happen. Hmm. And that's all I ever wanted to be and still all I want to be. So you come to Nashville and you get connected with some top guys. How did how did that happen and, and how did they wind up becoming mentors of yours? Well, when I was in the Bay Area, I was working a lot with a steel guitar player named Larry, uh, Bobby Black and his brother Larry. Larry played the guitar. And they, they were very encouraging to me. Uh, the first time I saw a number chart, Larry hired me to play rhythm guitar on a demo session and just handed me, you know, 14, 11, 55, 11. And it just made sense. I could play it. I don't see how they can even write books about it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, they had lived in Nashville and worked with Pete. So they recommended I look up Pete. Okay. And Pete did this thing he called the Drake School of Music, where you could hang around the studio and uh, just watch stuff. He talk, he tells stories, and it was amazing. You know, one of his great stories. His uh, secretary came in one day, all excited, and said, "Pete George Harrison is on the phone." And Pete looked at her blankly and said, "Who's he with?" <laughs> The Beatles. <laughs> he said, okay. Okay, I'll take that call. <laughs> and he went to England and played on uh, All Things Must Pass with George. What a record, man. Showed Peter Frampton how to use the talk box. How about that? Wow, that is so cool. So you really, so you lucked out in having this hookup with Pete. And Absolutely. he was kind enough to be open to nurturing you. It was a, an amazing experience. And, and one of the really great things is he was he was a very active producer at that point. So I could be a fly on the wall watching the A-team at work. And, you know, I, I come there and I'm all cocky. You know, I'm going to show these hillbillies how to play, you know, thinking anybody could play acoustic rhythm guitar. And then I saw a session. He had Ray Edmonton and Jimmy Capps playing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I have no idea how to do what they're doing. <laughs> All my cockiness went out the window. But they're really, they're so supportive there. I mean, most of the guys that I've talked to, you know, in your age bracket coming up, they were so – they were everybody above them was very supportive in, in mentoring. Like they, it's almost like they wanted you to learn. It, they weren't afraid of, you know, hey, I don't want to let this kid in because I'll lose sessions. It was like, hey, man, you know, if you're a nice guy and you're humble, we'll help you out. Is that how it worked with you? It, it was mostly true, but I was introduced to one session player, who I'll leave unnamed, a, a guitar player, played a lot of rhythm guitar and records. And my friend said, uh, so-and-so, this is Andy, just moved to town, he wants to get into sessions, maybe we can help him out. And he looked at me dead in the eye and said, Andy, I'll tell you how it is. You're my competition. Why should I help you? Holy shit. He said that? How I, yeah, just said it just like that. And I was thinking, yeah. How could I be his competition? He's playing all these records. But it wasn't long before he and I were kind of doing the same $25 song demos. So he, he wasn't wrong. Wow. Yeah, but, you know, I don't believe in competition. I think that there's enough, you know, especially back then, there's enough work to go around, man. I mean. Well, well, that that was the exception and, and, and not the rule. Yeah. Uh, my, my very good friend, Bill Hullett, who's another guy you should certainly mm. talk to. You know, I know Bill. Um, Bill was also doing the Drake School of Music thing and he'd been there for a while before I was and he really taught me that it was all about being friends, cooperating and getting along and it was absolutely right because that the, the, that's how it works you know who do you get a recommendation from another guitar player yeah I can do a gig I'm going to recommend another guitar player mm. Yeah, that's really weird. Uh, without saying names, did that guy have a long or a lengthy career? Yeah, he did great. Weird. That's the exception to the rule. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, for each one of these artists, I was wondering if you could talk about how you got the gig and the nature of the engagement, and maybe if you have a cool or interesting story about working with them. And the first would be John Oates. Well, a lot of the stuff I've done has come through the time jumpers, and John was one of those. We did, um, he decided he wanted to do a Christmas song and uh, used the time jumpers on that. And that was just a blast. He was just great to work with. He's a really smart musician, ridiculously talented. 
And uh, I kind of beat him up a little bit to simplify his chord changes and pushes and things like that. Cool. That's a hell of a backing band, by the way. <laughs> the time, yeah. you know, that's that's, that's a pretty good team. Man. Yeah. Yeah, he, he he did a song called "Santa Be Good to Me" with us, and uh, he he was kind enough to use me on the Opry with him a couple times. And he's just a great, great, really ridiculously talented guy. I'm of course a huge Tall and Oates fan. Yeah, Amy Grant. Uh, also to the Time Jumpers, really. We did a session with her. Um, there was a, a Patsy Cline tribute album, and we cut uh, "Back in Baby's Arms" with her. This was very early, before Vince was even a member of our band, and it was just great. She's so beautiful and so, such a great singer. And Reba, Reba McIntyre. Uh, I had a couple of good friends in the band, and they had the big plane crash. In 91, where uh, one plane full of guys died. It was a horrible event. I didn't know about that. That's horrible. Yeah. And uh, they had to scramble to put together a band. and They, they had the, the list of guys they were going to use, and then the, the alternative list. And one of my friends who played with her recommended me, so I was on the alternative. So I was on the alternative list, and I went in there and and you know, I knew the tunes. They they liked what I did and my sound, so I got the gig. This is long before Jeff was on there, Jeff King. Yes, yeah. long before. This was like ninety one. I was with her through ninety four. What are you working on now? That's got you excited. Um, well, working with the the Bad Rhythm Group that you mentioned uh, is is really a great thing for me. Uh, we also have a version of it called Big Bad Rhythm. Which is because uh, Bad Rhythm is a bassless quartet, it's, or trio rather. It's just guitar, drums, and piano. And Brian Holland is this absolute monster, play, primarily stride and boogie woogie type player. Mm. He's just ridiculously great. Danny Coots is an amazing drummer. So we just have a ball doing that. And then uh, we put together a version with the bass player and with uh, Pat Bergerson also playing guitar. And harmonica, mm. and that was just such a blast. I love Pat. Yeah, great player. And uh, so I'm really excited about that. We're talking about doing a big bad rhythm album. We've done two bad rhythm albums. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, come on here and talk about it if you if you get, uh, redo it. Absolutely. Hey, so uh, uh, of course I, the con- you know the continuing time jumpers is wonderful. And that's amazing that you've had a 20-year residency. 20 I mean, not amazing when you look at the, the people in the band. I mean, but that's amazing from, like, who has a 20-year residency? Well, it started out with us just being stubborn, you know, <laughs> and while wanting to play. And we'd outnumber the audience a lot of times. And we'd make no money at all. And then we got to where we're filling up. Uh, we played at a place called the Station Inn. We got to where we're filling that up pretty well. So, so we moved to Third and Lindsay, which is a much bigger club. Yeah. And that's been great for us. You know, but I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, I, th- I think it's overlooked. A lot of people think they see someone in a particular position they're in now. And I think oftentimes people think like you've always been in that position. And here you are telling me that you had a band of guys who are literally, yourself included, you know, some of the top musicians, not in the world, in Na- in Nashville, which therefore means the world at what you do, because Nashville is definitely the hotbed of, of, of musicians. And you were playing to empty places. And, you know, I think it's important that people heard that because there's a lot of guitarists listening to this and you know, everybody has to go through this stuff often. Well, yeah, it, it's certainly true. You, you always have to pay dues. It never ends. But, but we always did that band for love of the music and love of playing with each other and not, you know, any hopes of fame, fortune, monetary gain. And got to where we were pretty popular and making pretty good money. So that's nice. But that's not what we did it for. Yeah. But even if you did it for that, 
<laughs> you still suffered through that period of, oh yeah, you know, there's a ramp up to everything, every business, every project. It's not like you know. I think people sometimes have the false assumption that like everything's like the iPhone. It goes from zero to, I mean, that's just not real. That's one in literally maybe a hundred million things that, that might be one in a, in a, in a, a thousand things that Apple's even come out with, you know? Although it seems more easy to accomplish something like that these days than it used to be just because of, you know, the internet yeah. and the Facebook, all that social media stuff. So everything is accessible to millions of people. You kind of addressed it, but uh, maybe more specifically about what was your childhood like growing up in in the Bay Area and in that in you know in that ar- arena. Um, well, it was wonderful, really. I had a great childhood. My, my parents were wonderful people, very encouraging. Um, I had a lot of great friends. In fact, I had a great thing recently where my best friend in in a grade school contacted me recently, and he's a trumpet player in New York. Wow, and, that's cool. And he was doing new albums, and he came down to Nashville and got a few songs together for his new album. Now, had you been in contact with him, or uh, not really? Wow, that's so. You, not only did you get to reconnect, but you got to reconnect and play music. Yeah, yeah, it was a really magical little period. That's cool. That's really nice, man. His name is Ben Beerman. And um, what kind of work did your folks do out there? Uh, my dad started out as a professional photographer, and my mom was an artist, and they actually met in an ad agency in Santiago, Chile. That's cool, man. So you, yeah. so that's I could see they were probably super support. They were probably thrilled you went into the arts. Yeah, they they were very artistic. That's great. And then we moved. You know, when they moved, I was born in New York, and then they moved to San Francisco. And my dad couldn't really get his photography thing going, so he he uh, started a record store. Wow! So I kind of grew up in the record store, which was a great opportunity for me. That is so cool. Was there a specialization in the music or? His specialization was classical and international music. That's great. And he had a place in the St. Francis Hotel and then moved to a place called the Cannery down in Fisherman's Wharf. Okay. Unfortunately, after about six, seven years there, they opened a store a block away called Tower Records. Oh. <laughs> kind of tough to compete with Tower Records. <laughs> it was not. They, they were selling records for less than he could buy them. Yeah, I'm sure. I remember going to Tower Records downtown in West 4th Street and Broadway like almost weekly as a kid. You know, it was just such a cool yeah. experience. Oh, yeah. Now I get it why you're a Bukowski fan, too. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay, from San Francisco. Right. The dime just dropped on me now. So when you first started playing professionally as a, as a musician, were, were there any surprises about the business end outside of, of that? conversation you had with that one guy who said i'm not helping you at all well when i first started playing uh it was around san francisco and and there was a club scene there in the south bay mostly san jose fremont um where there were like probably 15 full-time country western clubs so you could make what was a good living there playing country music five six nights a week and it was competitive. There were a lot of great players. And it was really cool. I worked my way into that. Although that wasn't my first gig. What was your first gig? Well, right out of high school, I uh, I was in a starving rock band. <laughs> and then the, the drummer got a gig with a drag queen. And he said, we need a bass player. So I went and played bass. And it was amazing. It was 1971. Or making 175 bucks a week. That was really good money. That's back great then. money back then. Yeah. Any business lessons you learned there? Um, don't trust your boss. Yeah. What? Because you got screwed a few times. Yeah. They they had this. They had a three person management deal, and each one would blame the other one. And you just go around and around. And after a while, I realized they were just messing with me. You know. So you moved on. I moved on. Yeah. The, that's when I started playing country gigs, and uh, I went on the road. 
traveling in small small towns in Nevada, Fallon, Winnemucca, Elko. Did you ever uh, run into Red Volkart in any of your travels? I didn't then, but I met him in Nashville, of yeah. course. Yeah. And Red, Red's a good friend. I'm, of course, a huge fan of his. Oh, my God. Great guy. And he... You know, he was a young kid tri- up and down the West Coast, all over the place yeah. in there. So I was, that's why I was curious because he he played every every nook and cranny there is to play. Yeah, we we were definitely sort of in the same world there, but but I never ran into him. No. Uh, as far as like, if you had to go back and give your younger self advice, is there anything in particular you might have told yourself that would have made your life easier? Assuming you would have listened. Um. Don't don't marry that woman, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to look at it, you know, every, there's some spiritual growth that come out of things like that. There is. No, I mean, things just... They just went the way they went, you know? Yeah. Um, Everything worked out fine. That's great. So, man, I understand you're a pretty big collector of, of vintage guitars. Yeah, I have a lot of guitars. <laughs> what are your top three favorite in your collection? Not favorite that feel, you know, not like favorite because they're worth the most, just the ones that emotionally you have that best connection with when you pick them up. Uh, one is my 1966 Gibson Barney Castle. Wow. That I've had for probably 25 years now. And it's just kind of home. I just love that guitar. Where'd you uh, get that? On eBay. You're kidding me. $1,300. Wow. Which was a lot back then, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what you pay for it now. It was a good price for it. It wasn't a killer deal, but it was good. Yeah. And I just love the guitar, so it all works out. You lucked out that it was legit and all that stuff, too. Oh, yes, absolutely. Hmm. That was kind of the beginning of eBay back then. Yeah. Uh, A couple other favorites I have... uh, my friend Chris Bozang is a hand builder of acoustic guitars. I've got a couple of his that I really love. And he just rebuilt a Banner J45 for me, a 43, I think it is. That was in total shambles. And he did an amazing job bringing it to life. It's really wonderful. That's nice. Where is he out of? Is he in Nashville? Fairview, Tennessee. But now we're out. And then uh, I've got a 59 ES335. Just like a perfect guitar, it's just ridiculous. Tell me what you like most about that. Um, well, what's not to like? <laughs> it, it plays incredibly. The, the neck is the perfect shape. It sings on every note. Um, the pickups are—they're not the real aggressive PAFs. They're real sweet PAFs. And I really love them. Where'd you get that one? Uh, an old high school friend of mine had it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he sent me a couple pictures and email and said, it's trading time. What you got? Wow. Tell me what... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, nothing else. Do you know, like, there's a lot of new companies that have PAF pickups or, you know, PAF style. Have you played with any of them or are you familiar with any of them? Uh, I've played a lot of them. Um Seymour Duncan Seth Lovers, I think, are really great pickups. And those are PAFs? Yeah. I've got a set of Lolar pickups in uh, one of my guitars. and They're okay. They, they don't kill me. And uh, any other ones? Um, no. I'm curious about the uh, Ox 4. Yeah, Ox 4. You know what? Because, like, you see that 335 there? Yeah, it, it has I've been eyeing that. Whole time, <laughs> I love it. I got you know I got that in Nashville. I got that in Nashville, and I was there like last yeah. year. I, do you know John Prestia? I know who he is. He helped me get it, and uh, it, it was on Craigslist. But the the Bigsby was put on aftermarket, and like uh-huh. like me, I'm I don't I'm not a guitar tinkerer. Like I know how to plug it in, and kind of like with my car, I don't you know I, I could turn the key. Or I don't don't ask me to fix right. it. And uh, but when I found out that Bigsby was after market, I was like, man, I just imagined some idiot like me in his garage with a drill. And I'm like, eh, I don't know if that's a wise move. But we but we called the guy and I let John speak to him. He was real sweet. Um, you know, help me out with this. And the guy worked at Gibson, so they put it 
on in the Gibson. It was aftermarket, but in the Gibson factory, you know? So he came over and played, and I was like, man, I love it. But I was thinking, I have 57s in those, but I really would love, like, you know, I've been thinking about putting those PAFs, and I was just curious what you thought of some of the other I, ones. I would try it. My, my experience with the 57s is not like love, I'm afraid. Really? They, yeah, they sound kind of boxy to me. Hmm. A little too mid rangey, maybe. Yeah, well, I have them in an SG, and I love them in there. That I can tell you. But I, I'm just this one. I was thinking, man, it may be nice to, you know, see what they were like. And then, but they have the Ox Fours. There's different ones. There's like Freddie King ones. There's uh, Dwayne Allman ones. Um, well, that's the thing is, uh, PAFs really vary widely, you know. So to say generically, I like PAFs is, is kind of weird because they all sound different. Yeah. What would you recommend for that if I – just the standard PAF, the Freddie King, the, the Dwayne Allman? I, I'm not that familiar with their mm. variety, but uh, Dwayne Allman might be a good choice. Okay. Thanks. And, and the Seymour Duncan Seth Lovers would be great in that guitar too. Oh, they would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to be in Nashville end of the month. Maybe I'll bring this guitar with me and give it back yeah. to, to, to John or bring it to Joe probably. Um, cool. So, so you got that three thirty five from an old high school friend. Very cool, yeah. man. And then uh, another one I got originally that I really love is a fifty two gold top Les Paul oh. that somebody converted to a fifty six. I got that from George Grill. Wow! And it's, I never got P nineties before, but these are just amazing. They're they're full and throaty, but they're still really clear. It's just a wonderful sounding guitar. And they're the original P90s? Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, somebody took off the trapeze and put on a tunematic, a cut down tunematic and a stop. So it's really kind of the perfect guitar. Wow. That's really nice, man. I love gold tops. I yeah, really love those. They're so, they're so cool looking. For daily playing, what's your go to guitar? Probably the 335 is. If I go to a gig, that's what it's going to be. I used to be a big Fender guy, and I've got some great Fenders, but that's just not kind of my bailiwick right now. Yeah. Do you find you change periodically, like you get into a certain Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you go through phases. Isn't that cool? But I've got a great Strat and a great Tele and a great Jazzmaster, all that stuff, but I just like the Gibsons. That's so cool that you could do that, though. Like, you know, you just... You know, it's like an old friend when you have a guitar, you know, and you haven't, no, I want to play this old friend that I haven't played with, Yeah, you know, haven't been acquainted, or haven't had a conversation. Oh, I like that, man. I think it's such right. a, nice, a nice thing. Yeah, it's really nice. Any players who influence your playing that people would be surprised to hear? I don't know about surprised. Um, I was, like I said, really into the blues and BB and Albert and Buddy were, were the guys for me. But then I just wanted to hear more harmonically, and I wanted to get into jazz, and I was really enjoying Kenny Burrell and Grant Green and Barney Kessel, and it, but couldn't quite get there, you know. Hmm. So I read all their interviews in Guitar Player. They all talked about Charlie Christian. It all comes from Charlie Christian. And they came out with a great box set of Charlie Christian stuff, so I bought that. And sure enough, that was just my world for a couple of years. That's cool. So you is you've played so many guitars. Have you ever had a guitar or played a guitar that you thought and an amp that you thought was like, oh my god, this is the holy grail, and it's been the barometer at, at which you've measured every other holy grail. Um, I, I use a, a brand new brand called Little Walter Tube Amps. Oh yeah, yeah, I know them. They, they all just sound spectacular to me. I've been really happy with those. And also, um, I've got a couple of vintage fenders that are just magic. I've got a 54 Tweed Twin that is amazing. Uh, a 51 Pro that is really just a perfect amp. Yeah, those old the fenders. Little, Walter, little Walters are very much like the old 51 Pro the octal tubes and uh, just very simple wiring. Where is, he's, uh, is he out of North Carolina? Yeah, he is. Yeah, okay. I like simple, you know, I don't want too much EQ. I don't want effects loops and channel switching and all that. I don't want it. Hmm. 
So you like the little Walters for the modern. How about guitar? Is, is there a holy grail of guitars that you've played? Like something that you touch that, or, or maybe that's your 335. It pretty much is, yeah. Wow, that's and pretty... the Les Paul's up there too. The gold I mean, time, I, yeah. I, I I have really great examples of, of everything. You know, I've got a, a D'Angelico and Stromberg acoustics. I've got two Barney Kessels, a Tal Farlow, an L five. So I've I've got everything. <laughs> that's a good problem to have. You know? Yeah. Is. is it hard to figure out? Like sometimes. You know, when you sit down to play, like just to get settled with which guitar you want. Well, th- there's probably ten of them that are really perfect guitars, so any one of them would make me thrilled to play on any gig at any moment. Hmm. Do you still practice? Of every day. How how long and what are you typically playing when you practice? Uh, I play for a couple hours. I'll run through scales, and a lot of times I'll just solo endlessly over songs because I find when I'm playing jazz, the more I know a song, the better I can play it. So, the, more, the more you're I'll, familiar with the changes and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Right. To, to get in and out of them. So I, I, I'll just practice soloing actually quite a bit. Hmm. And then I, you know, I try and keep the technique up. I'm getting older. So I, I know I have to keep the hands moving. Sure. It's always so cool to, uh, you know, the work ethic of a top pro like you. It's you know, it's just like you know, like Michael Jordan was the first guy at the peak of his career. He was still the first guy in the stadium and the last guy to leave. And it's so impressive that, you know, when, when guys like you that are A list first call guys that are still like, you know, hey man, I want to be on top of my game, you know, and I take this, you know, that's a that's a, like pride of ownership, you know, which I think is great. I respect that. I mean, there's all that, but it's a love thing, too. I just love to play the guitar, you know. Mm-hmm. So all my life, you know, I've been a pretty ambitious practicer, and it's never been a chore for me. Mm. So that's so nice to hear, man. Uh, what was the first record or CD you ever had or you ever bought yourself, if you remember? The, the first album I bought for myself was Cold Sweat by James Brown. <laughs> that's cool, man. How about Desert Island Discs? If I asked you what were your top three discs just for today and in no particular order. Yeah, because that's not something you could peg down. Uh, after Frank, Count Basie, Live at the Sands. Um, certainly one of the Ben Webster and Sweets Edison records. And then probably Albert King with Booker T and the MGs. I don't know if I have that album. I thought I had all the Albert King stuff. Albert King with Booker King, Booker T and the MG. Well, well, that, well, that was all the classic stack stuff he did. Booker T was playing, was the band. Okay. And those records are just perfect. He's got a couple of, uh, you know, I think it's Tuesday night and Wednesday night live in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, I went, where was that at the Fillmore? Or was that, where was that? If you're a no. I'm not sure. I think it was the Fillmore. Those are great records, man. I remember listening to those as a young kid over and over. Hey, man, you've been through this whole thing a long time. What's some of the most important things you've learned about yourself during this journey? Uh, I have a tendency to doubt myself, so I've learned to stay confident and stay upbeat and and believe in myself, And, and that's not always easy, you know? Yeah, I do know. What do you what like? So when you when you have some self doubt, do you like have to talk yourself through it, or what do you do to like keep that at bay? Because I know with me, sometimes I'll have, I'll literally talk to myself in situations like that because, and I pretend I'm like a I'm, I pretend I'm like talking to a client. Like if I was, how would I advise a client of mine to do this? I definitely talk to myself, but but mostly I just try and shift gears, you know. Yeah. Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. I don't know. I'm pretty straight ahead, you know. Um, I love dogs. I love to cook. Um, <laughs> not much else. What do you like to cook? Cooking's a big hobby for a lot of musicians. It's a, it's a very creative thing. Yeah. 
All, all kinds of things. Uh, I, I really enjoy Asian food. and try and eat a lot of Asian food. It's real healthy for you, too. Yeah. Usually. Hey, man, let's go back to, you know, this might relate to the other question. When you're having a bad day, how do you turn it around? Uh, well, a nap is good. Um, Check there with my, my buddy, the Bulldog Bubbles. <laughs> who's snapping at my feet right now. I was going to say, he quieted down finally. Actually, that's the other dog, Ella. But anyway, um, sometimes pick up the guitar, play for a while. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a pretty cathartic uh, thing to do. Who you reckon has had the biggest influence on you, either musically or personally or both? Um, personally, I'd have to say my mother. She was always a big advocate of me as an artist and as a person. That's great. Um, professionally, I'd have to go with Mr. Bradley, Harold Bradley. Harold Bradley. Do you have any non-musical superpowers? No. Anything you're still interested in learning how to do? Yeah, I'm going to play the guitar better, cook better. It's I funny. Like to be I am. You like to be healthier? It's funny. Um, top performers never see themselves like that. They're always like, you know, looking for the next slight edge on something. You know, that's why you're practicing two hours a day. Well, I don't even th- think of it as an edge as much as. Uh, well, playing music to me is a journey, you know, a journey without the end. Yeah. There is there. You just have to keep moving down, down the road. Yeah. But when I see people who think that they're all that and they're there, you know, it's, it's just absurd. Uh, yeah, that is absurd in any field. Yeah. You, you just get stagnant, complacent, and you have nothing left. Yeah. Yeah. That makes absolutely no sense. Is there... Anything like if you if you had to go back in time, is there any one thing you might have done differently, either you know besides marrying that first wife, uh, either personally or professionally? Not really, you know. I mean, it, the road unfolded pretty logically for me. That's great. Two more questions, man. What's the uh, toughest decision you ever had to make, or the hardest thing you ever had to do? Uh, you know, putting dogs down might be the hardest. Yeah, that is really, really tough. Deciding when it's time to end the life of someone you love, you know. Yeah, that's a very difficult thing, man, for sure. And it's one of those things like it's like being pregnant. You can't imagine what it's like unless you've done it. That's exactly right. You know, yeah, it's a tough thing, man. And, man, the last question, and I, I really appreciate your time. What's been the biggest change in your personality? <laughs> over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and how much is just a part of aging? I think more confidence. Uh, I've been divorced for about 15 years and that's been really good for me. Good. I, I tended to subjugate myself in the marriage. And oh, now, man. Yeah, that's got to take it, care of yourself. Yeah, and so coming out of that, I, I feel a lot more confident in myself and uh, able to accept and enjoy thinking of myself as more of an artist. That's great, man. That's really nice. Man, so you must feel like a million times better. Yes. Good for you, man. That's that's really nice to hear. And actually, I'm going to ask you one more question. What's, uh, you know, knowing life is precious and time is not infinite, what would you say the one thing that's most important to you to either state of mind or something to focus on or something to surround yourself with that from your perspective, that's part of you making the most of, of whatever time you do have left and using it wisely. Um, I have two kids and a grandson being with them and watching them prosper is, is super important to me. That's nice, man. They, are they in Nashville? Yeah. They're oh, in that's- Nashville. That's great, man. That's really good. Well, and, be- uh, and, and being a better musician, I'm being 
after a while, the, the goal isn't getting better as much as just eliminating all the bullshit. Yeah, but the amount of bullshit that comes out of your fingers is probably <laughs> – your, your, your baseline of performance is really, is really high, man. But that's great that you're hungry enough to still want to do that, man. That's fantastic. You know, it, it is a refinement thing. I want to play with more soul and more integrity. And I, I hate all the guitaristic BS, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like what pedal – are you using or something? Yeah, right, right. Or, or, you know, here's some fancy lake I can play to impress this guy. Yeah. Yeah, integrity is everything. I mean, and, and you know, that that's all listeners want. I agree with that. You know, what? it's what makes you feel something. Now, that might be different for different things. You know, some guy might listen to a shredder and say, oh, my God, that's like heaven on earth. But as long as that guy's shredding with integrity, that's going to count. But just doing that yeah. stuff for whatever, just because, that's never going to be the guy that anybody wants to hear. And, and I think if people walk away singing something you played and saying, wow, that was beautiful, it really touched me, that means a lot more than, than being impressed with how much technique you have. Yeah. Yeah, totally, man. I agree with you. Man, you I know, can't. Barney, Barney Kessel once said that he figured everybody could play fast. He wanted to hear something with some meaning to it. Yeah. It's funny. I've watched some videos of him on YouTube. He was a pretty, like, you know, none of that stuff, like everybody that's really good, is was accidental. He was a very deliberate, very well thought out guy. He communicated really well. He was. He was quite blunt and opinionated, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'd rather that personally. You know, I'd, I'd rather know, you know, like, don't piss on my back and tell me it's raining out, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was very uh, – like I saw this – I remember this teaching video and just the way he was talking about improvisation. I was like, man, that's – you know, it was just a, a nice – it was just – he had a good spin on things, the way he communicated and then his, his – you know. Of course, like it's not long afterwards I get totally lost because I'm not – I'm not anywhere near that, but I mean, his communication and, and his ideas of how to do things are really, really unique and very well spoken. So, yeah, man, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Let me tell everybody where to find, find you. It's Andy Reese, R E I S S. And, uh, the smartest thing you could do is check them out with the time jumpers. They have gigs every Monday night and they play often outside of Monday nights. Uh, and you can go to timejumpers.com. Andy's one of the, I think the only founding members left, no? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, he's a, a just a wonderful player. He, he's so sincere about playing, and that really comes across when he picks up the guitar. And if nothing else, you get to see him play some really cool vintage <laughs> instruments. Yeah. And uh, he's also available for tracks. If anybody's listening and you want to get a hold of Andy for tracks, he does a lot of session work. Uh, you can hit him up on Facebook and that's about it, man. I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, man. I'm really glad we got to connect. My pleasure, sir. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Support Andy Reese and the rest of the guys in the Time Jumpers. Check them out on timejumpers.com. Buy their records and uh, go see them out if you're in the Nashville area, man. They're just a really cool band. I appreciate you spending time with us, Andy. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter and to get some special offers. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Yeah, yeah, it's all about that. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.